Hi, everyone here and around the world. This month of April 2024, so far, we have had viewers from 116 countries and are close to breaking through 265,000 subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed, please click on that red button on your screen. It doesn't cost you anything, but it helps us with YouTube. And in this ominous time of tactical nuclear missiles and drones flashing through Middle Eastern skies, I want to send all of you from all of us at Earth Files, including Chocolate and Fluffy, a big agape hug with deep prayers that peace and protection will surround you wherever you are on this troubled planet. I reached out to a reliable aerospace source who has worked directly with Tall White and Nordic ETs to see if he thinks they are still trying to block human wars from getting bigger with nukes. And here is his reply, quote, the Tall Whites are very human looking Nordics, are the two ET groups that I personally have had direct experience with. We humans are truly a blended bunch with them because we are their offspring of sorts. I do know for a fact that in the early stages around 1992, there was a program in place to train hand-picked military pilots to work alongside a small group of tall whites in craft and more advanced space vehicles serviced out of Whiteman Air Force Base southeast of Kansas City, Missouri. The blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Scandinavian-looking Nordics do most of the policing and are more of a military-type group. The Nordics work closely with JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command based in MacDill Air Force Base in Florida and Fort Liberty in North Carolina. The Nordics provide a type of security over our deep space exploration and travel. But it's the 10 to 12 feet tall whites who are much more hands-on technically and can even counteract when timelines are weaponized into different time frames by competitive forces, close quote. Both ET groups, Nordics and tall whites, help us humans learn how to do deep space exploration on three Space Force ships the ETs have helped us build. The USS Curtis LeMay, the USS Hoyt Vandenberg, and the USS Roscoe Hellenketter. A certain number of tall whites and Nordics are always assigned to those human space missions to provide technical support and protection, close quote. And quote, they are always on our spacecraft for different programs before we humans try to make a space-time jump to a different time frame signature. The Nordics will make sure that the new time frame signature is not hostile, close quote. And now comes a new book posted at Amazon.com four months ago entitled Phantoms in the Night, or ETs, My Lifelong Experience of Contact with the Paranormal by Lorraine McAdam, who was born in December 1964 and raised in Lower Darwin, England, about 25 miles north of Manchester. Today, Lorraine lives with her husband further north in Cumbria, not far from the Irish Sea and southern Scotland. She worked as a nurse for 12 years, and then at age 45, she trained to become a teacher. Now at age 59, she runs her own tuition company. And finally, after years of suppressing her contacts with Nordic ETs, she has written and published, quote, my own simple, truthful, riveting, intriguing, and sometimes frightening account of multiple encounters and experiences with beings that I believe originate from other worlds and possibly other dimensions. Close quote, Lorraine McAdam, author, Phantoms in the Night or ETs. This past weekend, on April 13th, Lorraine shared with me 
her illustration of two Nordic men who have been helping her in her earth human life since age eight in 1974. That's when the Nordics placed on Lorraine's bedroom ceiling a screen in which the two Nordic men appeared and talked to her from the screen as depicted here in this illustration by Lorraine and her illustrator, Leif Martin. She also saw their Nordic craft landed in the field outside her bedroom several times and worked with her illustrator to produce this image and others in her new book about her extraordinary interactions with what she is no longer afraid to say in public that she has seen and been with extraterrestrial Nordics since she was eight years old, shown in this photograph with her brother. Between being born in 1966 and graduating from high school in 1982, when you think back at those years, what is the first year that you remember feeling that you were either being haunted or afraid or sensing something from people around you? I would say 1972, when I was about eight years old, I started to be quite nervous and scared. I started to sense things like the ghost at my auntie, my great auntie. She was my mother's mother's sister, and she was a spirit medium. And she used to look at me and she used to say, did you know, you've got four spirit guides. And the first ghost I ever saw was actually at her house. And I went upstairs and I saw a man in pyjamas and he looked perfectly solid. And I took him to just be a visitor or something because she used to take lodges in. And I went down and said, who's that man upstairs? And she said, oh, can you describe? That's my dead husband. She said, you've got the gift, which I talk about at the beginning of my book. It seemed to come on just before puberty, to be honest. And then I had contact from the Nordic PT. The strange thing is, it didn't bother me, it didn't scare me, I wasn't frightened. It seemed fairly normal to me that I could talk to these two men. What was the first time that you encountered the blonde Nordic and the dark-haired Nordic as a child in grade school that you could talk with? Well, the first time, and this might connect to the fact that my parents were breaking up, was when my mum put me into my father's bed because they were living in the same house, but they didn't want to be together. So that could be significant because that really upset me, the fact that they were going to break up eventually. Then divorces were more long and drawn out than they are now. So that began to happen and I found it quite upsetting. And I know in some ways the Nordic PTs were comforting to me. Did the two men that have been in your life since then as Nordic non-humans to you, did they appear physically in your house, in the yard, or that strange screen that opened up in the ceiling of your bedroom? Just on the strange screen initially, and then shortly after, the blonde one, I had a really vivid dream of going into the field behind the house where the blonde was landed, and he came down some steps, and he came and greeted me and and that was the blonde one. How did it all happen that you would be going to bed? And what were the details of what was happening that you end up seeing on a screen above you? And you were born in 1966, so this would have been in the 1970s. Yes. How did this screen with Nordic ETs on it happen in your bedroom on the ceiling? I really don't know how it happened. The only thing I can think is that they were controlling me in some way not to be scared because I don't remember being frightened. I remember feeling unusually calm, if anything. And it just materialised like, if you will, today. Have you ever seen the cinema screens that you can get in your homes and they project onto a blank kind of white screen? So it was like that. The next minute, they were there. You know, it was instant, really, but you're talking about on the ceiling above your bed, you would have thought that in the 1970s, when nothing like that existed, 
that that would have scared you so much that you would have gone running to your parents? No, I didn't, though, because I somehow, on some level, I feel that they were calming me down and almost like they were saying, you mustn't say anything about this. The fact that my father came in and he wasn't meant to and caught me because he never really came in like that made me realise there was something odd about this. It was almost like, and this has happened since, you know, throughout my life. I feel they can control, I don't know how they do it, but I feel they can control your reactions and dull them down. Does that make sense? To D-U-L-L, dull your reaction down to them. Yes, so that you don't flip out or whatever. I mean, when I've seen Landy Craft, a big craft, hover over the field, and again, I was unusually calm. And I comment on my book how calm I was, that I just looked at him and then went back to sleep. And what age would you have been at the first sighting in the field of one of these craft? It was 2008. So you had no interaction with craft before age 42? I didn't see them in real time. I saw them in very vivid dreams until I saw this one. You know, this was the first one, so to speak, that I saw in reality. Does that make sense? I'm looking at the four colored illustrations, and I wondered if you could tell me upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right, using those directions, which craft have you physically been out at the field and seen and heard in front of you? Tell me if you have been on any one of them. Right. The bottom left is the most accurate to what I saw that night. And it was hovering over the field, as you see it there. You never saw this before the year 2008 when you were 42? I didn't. This was almost like it was given to me as a gift or something. But another thing that happened was that I became a lot more intelligent. And I wasn't the brightest cookie in the jam jar. Then suddenly I understood things that I hadn't been able to understand at school, and I suddenly became very bright, and I went from being perhaps mediocre to actually topping everything in the second year, and I got prizes for it, book prizes, and everything started to make sense to me in science and math. You were what age then? I was about 11 years old then. In that period of time, between age 6 to age 9 or 10, What specifically did the two male Nordics, one blonde and one brown-haired, that appeared on a screen in your bedroom up on the ceiling, what were you feeling that was coming off of them to you that you didn't feel from other people? I felt like they were protecting me in some way. I felt very protected by them, that somehow they were guarding me, that I was important to them, and I, I don't know why that would be, and that they sought contact with me throughout my life. It seems like you have been given a hint of what it is that the Nordics are involved with, which is genetic manipulation of life on this planet, and that they have been for eons, and that they would be interested in you and other people in the abduction syndrome because they are tracking bloodlines. I kind of worked that one out for myself. Is it because of my DNA? And the fact that he asked about my father's side of the family, you know, it was almost like, are they giving you a clue? This is why we've taken you, because I have kind of looked into this, and I'm still reading about the fall of Atlantis, and they moved openly amongst us and intermarried with us at that time. And I've had a memory of, being married to one in a past life come back to me. And I had red hair in that life and I have red hair in this life. And my father has red hair and blue eyes. I have green eyes, but when Hyperborea fell, when Atlantis fell, a lot of them escaped. And I wonder if they're just tracing their bloodlines. Yeah. Exactly what you're saying. And we have this connection. How big do you think the genetic program on Earth is right now in 2024 between the Nordics as one extraterrestrial group that can be blonde-haired or brown-haired but look very human, 
the tall whites, which is another category because at adulthood they're 10 to 12 feet tall, the grays that come in a variety of both biological and artificial intelligence, and a number of others that can be the color of cerulean blue skin, the praying mantis insects. There's a long list now. Do you have any personal insight from the Nordics that have interacted with you because they're interested in the, your genetic bloodline related to them? Have you been taught or educated about any of the other non-humans that are interacting with our planet now? Yes, I've been told that they are within some kind of federation and that they might not necessarily like each other. They all agreed to obey the rules of this federation and they need permission to do things. The greys are very crafty about how they will get permission, the reptilians as well, how they behave. What is your own personal opinion or perspective right now on April 13th, 2024, about what is going on between reptilian, blonde, Nordic humanoids, gray humanoids? What do you see as the current reality on our planet of the relationship of those non-humans? The greys and the reptilians want absolute control. That's my feeling. They don't want us to revolve. Many people are still asleep. They are not aware at all of the background to any of this. They don't know what's going on. And I feel like the greys want to raise our consciousness. The reptilians don't want us to evolve or raise our consciousness at all and want to keep us down. But I feel the Nordics, the ones that are friendly towards us at least, have added their DNA to the human genome. Mm -hmm. I feel the Nordics want us to evolve spiritually. They want us to reach a higher consciousness. And there's a war going on currently where the Nordics try to free us. The reptilians trying to prevent it. I urge everyone to go to Amazon.com and do a search to get Lorraine's new book and the title, Phantoms in the Night or ETs. And I want to add another insight that she gave me in our very long discussion from the two Nordic men. She told me that her father's family goes back generations and is associated with this symbol of the fleur de lis that is historically linked to French royalty. It is also the lily flower that symbolizes both the Holy Trinity and is the emblem of the Virgin Mary. Lorraine says historically, the fleur de lis symbolizes purity, light, chastity, spiritual growth, and royal blood in France, but what Lorraine thinks that the Nordic ETs were trying to show her was that the rare Fleur de Lis human bloodlines have come from the Nordic ETs doing genetic manipulation through history. And I asked Lorraine if the Nordic ETs and gray ETs have superior technology, while the tall whites are supposed to have perhaps the most advanced technologies, why would this conflict between reptiles on the earth and all these other ET species go on for centuries? Why wouldn't the reptiles be able to be chased out of earth by the advanced technologies of the Nordics and the tall whites? And Lorraine answered, that's a good question. I suspect it is tied to what the different ETs in the Federation are given permission to do. The rules are supposed to be very complex about what each species can and cannot do to each other. But I think that the general consensus among the Nordic ETs is that everything is getting beyond the pale now, too dangerous. Further, she said, I've been told that we humans have the technology to stop nuclear bombs from even going off so that they will land harmlessly in the sea. And that technology will be deployed if necessary. Some people will just completely panic and have no clue. So I think the first thing that needs to happen 
is people need to be waked up to the fact that this has been happening for a long time and is happening now. It is incredible that it has remained separated from most of the human population, including myself and Lorraine and other contactees. Why has the truth of other life in this universe been so successfully hidden? Continuing with Lorraine, I have been shown that we will see more craft in Earth's skies, she told me, which will be Nordics returning to their ancient bases on Earth. Many of their ancient bases are under the Atlantic Ocean, so those sightings will be what the government calls USOs, unidentified submerged objects. And the reason for the Nordic return to ancient Earth bases will be to defend the Earth literally, according to Lorraine. The blonde and brown-haired Nordics gave me the analogy, she said, of a boil being lanced in all these current conflicts and wars. We are in a kind of scenario where something dramatic is going to happen, definitely. But she says they don't want to make the mistake, as I feel that they have done in the past, of taking over completely to govern us. They want us humans to govern ourselves correctly, properly, not in the way we currently are, with all the political divisions and wars, close quote. And I want to urge all of you, go to Amazon, do a search on Lorraine McAdam and her book that I think is going to be valuable for everyone. And that it is interesting to me how her insights have been evolving and evolving into this book and to this time when I think all of you, I certainly do, feel that we are in very dangerous ground, dangerous frequencies. And I wonder, Ian and Eric, I wonder if we could do a poll now at the Earth Files YouTube channel on how many of you agree with Lorraine McAdam and what we have shared here tonight from her experiences with Blonde Nordics and this new book that is extremely valuable in content. How many people responded inside mentally, spiritually, any other way to the words that she spoke tonight? And with that, Ian, <laughs> welcome to a sense of doing a show that feels honest to me about the frequencies that everyone is beginning to be, I think, very concerned about on our planet, knowing that if Lorraine and others are correct, we are going to have help even if we don't understand it yet. Yes, uh, that was fascinating. And I've got a copy of Lorraine's book sitting on my table right in front of me. And I've had many long chats with Lorraine during the last week or so. So I really urge everyone like you do, go out and get her book and find out about her other experiences and what she's um, experienced since, uh, the, uh, since being a child. And that brings us to the first question I have for you, Linda. Well, can we it do is, that? Um, We're going to do the poll or is Eric doing the poll now? It, the um, poll's already up. Oh, OK. It's, um, it's filling out as we speak. All right. So, uh, while the while the poll rolls and uh, people uh, vote on the poll, I've got a question here. Lost in space makes a comment. I was four years old. I saw two pointed headed people watching me at night, and C Watkins sixty three says, "What would Nordics want with children? Why is there the contact at this early age?" It has always been one of those questions that I can remember talking with Bud Hopkins about uh, uh, that. People were very upset in long ago when I was just getting into uh, 79 and 80, uh, trying to understand animal mutilations and learning about abductions. And the idea that there would be other intelligences from other planets who were focused on taking children 
uh, at young ages and teenage years was uh, something of, of concern. And when you put it into the context of the last, from let's say start going all the way back into uh, the 1960s up to 2024, uh, the human abduction syndrome has been being discussed uh, ever since then, and the important case that was on television of Betty and Barney Hill that goes back into the 1960s and was the most important and well done, I think, television production trying to deal with the abduction question. And it w Betty, who did not have any real trauma, and her husband was the one who had the trauma, uh, she found that she could communicate with the beings and th they had this discussion about the three-dimensional uh, space looking at our end of the uh, particular solar system that we're in and where there was in a 3D holographic um, I don't know whether to say it was a projector. Betty didn't know, but she was looking into a 3D uh, recreation of our part of the uh, Milky Way galaxy where there's this solar system and their solar system and others. And that she did not feel threatened. She felt, in fact, that this particular type, which was somewhere in the category of a gray, um, that they were interested in what she had to say or react to what they were showing her. And as she said, when I said, well, where are we on there? And there was an answer, if you don't know where you are, how could I possibly show you? Um, and that, the, 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 that underscored that at least adult humans could telepathically have a conversation about things astronomical. But when it came to the children, uh, I think throughout the years, it is fair to say that that has been one of the confusing and difficult areas because some children have no problem with adapting to the funny man who came into the room, while others uh, in many, many different other situations can express a trauma after something had happened at night and they don't want to go back into the room. It's very complex. And what none of us really know objectively as hard fact is in any given abduction situation, which non-human was truly the conductor of the abduction, because they shapeshift, they change. The, the uh, reptilians can look like Nordics. The Nordics could, if they wanted to, could look like somebody else. They have this ability, all of them advanced technologies, uh, to change what they, how they appear. And if that has been the case on Earth for thousands of years, it's, it helps to uh, explain why humans never caught on to what was actually happening around them, that it was other intelligences, it was interpreted in other ways. And this is one of the, I think, strong pieces in Lorraine's book, is that she is providing and laying out in 107 pages with very good illustrations what she feels at this point she could express from herself. And a lot of people that I have interviewed will find reflections of what they've experienced. And now, as Lorraine would say and other abductees, why can't the governments of this planet agree <coughs> to tell the truth of what they know about other intelligences so that the whole world at the same time can start learning together and that it could possibly change all of the potential for dangerous wars in the future. That is the prayer, that is the hope. So on that note, Ian, 
I go back to you for more information, if you have any on the poll and for other questions. Yeah, here's an update on the poll. Uh, the poll is currently uh, showing 84% saying yes. So yes, they do believe Lorraine and her story and her encounters. Yeah. So we'll keep you updated as the poll keeps going. Yeah. Uh, Christina Ledesma Jimenez is here again tonight in the chat. She says, love you, Earth Files. Um, Linda, amazing story tonight. Yeah. She yeah. confirms, my eight-year-old daughter sees things as well, and I believe it starts when we are, when we are young. So yes. again, more... Yeah emphasis about it starting so so young with his uh, with his children and we've also got someone in the chat tonight um i've just fired their their um message they said they're six and five it started with them when they were four years old as well and i think if lorraine were here that she would say because she eight years old is when she uh picks that as the year that she thinks that her interactions really began and there is the issue of the telepathy. The, all of the non-humans that are described in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of interviews that I have done with people in the abduction syndrome, that the non-humans are picking up from a human in front of them even questions that haven't been formed in the human's mind. There's been articles written about this anticipation, something about the, the non-human's ability to interact with human minds has that kind of flexibility and fluidity. And it may be that a child's mind is easier to interact with by the beings than an adult mind much later on. It may also have to do with the We've got this gigantic question, and it's always there, and that is which non-humans interacting with Earth now and over thousands, millions of years, which ones are involved in huge planet-wide genetic manipulation projects? Uh, I have talked about the document that I read in 19... 83, uh, which talked about these extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA and already evolving primates to create Homo sapien. All questions and mysteries about the evolution of Homo sapien on this planet have been answered and these projects are closed. And that means that the, the genetic component, the genetic manipulation of life on planet Earth is a huge part of why there is extraterrestrial interest in this planet and has been for a long time. And that this came up at the end of our discussion, Lorraine and mine, about the whole sense that what we are in is a gigantic genetic manipulation and that maybe some of it is positive. Maybe some of it is negative. Those of us who are on the outside of the scientists and the governments who ha are studying now and have studied in the past and will study in the future, they may have some of those answers. And that's why this big swath of humanity that has been denied Q&A about this hugely important subject that we're not alone in this universe, that there are other consciousnesses, other life forms, and they've been interacting with our solar system and our planet for a very long time. That we deserve to know the truth and that whatever the relationships are, if it can be positive, as it is between Lorraine and the two Nordics that look so identical to humans all of us have known, and for years, I've heard from people working in the CIA and SADIA world, if you want to know what some of the extraterrestrials look like, just look at photographs in Scandinavia, which, again, that's the Nordic component. But I also received about three years ago a very interesting, uh, we'll just say it was a series of notes from somebody who was working in aerospace who had 
been able to work with one of the tall whites. And the whole paper was that we, we think, we humans, we like to sit down, we like to have coffee or wine or whatever it is. We like to talk, we like the energy, the interaction of being able to talk and we're noisy and, and that's humanity. Well, these other beings that it's silent, it's telepathy, images, films going out here, anticipating everything that we noisy humans are going to think of. It's like sort of out of sync, uh, life forms that would be out of sync and would have to learn how, if they wanted to, to be somewhat in sync. Maybe that's not possible. But that doesn't mean that we humans, homo sapien, that we should be denied the chance to be able to be uh, introduced to non-humans that our government or governments think have a positive, constructive interest in our planet, in our species, in our solar system, not something that is marauding for helium-3 or uh, iridium or whatever it is that uh, are, is needed from one end of the universe to the other, that metals and crystals of various types are always going to be needed. And it, where we are right now on April 17th, 2024, is in this no man's land of no one really having all the evidentiary material that our government has and other governments have. And we are left in a waiting where who is finally going to step up to the plate and explain to humanity that we are genetically manipulated species, that there are beings who do care about what happens to us and there are others that may not. And that somewhere just like earth, as on earth, below, as above, that there is confusion, there is conflict, there is destruction, there are wars, and then there are others who are trying very hard to get rid of war, get rid of conflict, neutralize into the evolutionary path of the soul learning how to grow in all of these different contexts. And that ultimately, maybe at some point, the ability for Homo sapien to have a communication with those that genetically made us may be a huge strong step for both. That maybe what is lacking in this universe is black versus white with very little communication between the different frequencies, the different levels, and that this is part of why this universe was created. Well, maybe if humans step up and say, we need to understand more. We can't be afraid. We have got to learn more from government, scientists, medical people, everybody. Because if we're gonna go out to Mars, if we're gonna go out beyond into our own solar system, if we're going to go to other solar systems, is Earth gonna be represented by one half of 1% of the population? Or are we going to finally be allowed to know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, which once upon a time in a poem and in a song said that will set us free. Okay, Ian. Yeah, Linda, that, that's well said. We've got people in the chat, such as Miss Anonymous 617 says they want us to evolve, but humans res refuse to evolve. And I Can't Explain also addresses the many, the most 
most complex of the uh, of this phenomena that is that the problem with all these beings is that there are different factions even within their own species uh, so yes a lot of good chat about this subject in our in our live chat tonight where we provide a safe space for people to share their experiences we've even got people with experiences sharing their experiences yeah. tonight and uh i'm ian, just going to ian, just going I to go into our <laughs> hello ian i just picked up dear chocolate and i know that a lot of people out there are laughing because he loves to jump up here and wave his tail around and i picked him up and he is docile he is wonderful he is loving he is passive and i'm going to let him go in the freedom of what we're talking about tonight, that we shouldn't all be tied up for preconceived reasons and let him walk around and hopefully he won't always have his tail up. But I did this for a reason. I think we can always be loving and patient with the pets that we love so much because they sort of don't talk back. But humans need to be able to do a hug with a fellow human, even if they disagree. And if we could evolve and get to that point, then maybe Earth would truly be livable without the danger of war. I pray for that every day. Go ahead, Ian. Yes, and we've closed the poll now, and here are the results that are in. Do you agree with Lorraine McCart? McAdams, yes, 82%, no, 17%. And the poll is complete. Yeah. Thank you. And if we all tried, if we just all tried to understand each other, and I suppose the competition for resources, money, and power, that those are the big factors that keep separating out century after century after century of humans. But maybe... And I think Lorraine and others probably would feel this is true. Until we are introduced officially, until all humans on planet Earth know that we are not alone in this universe and that we are not the only intelligent life form on this planet, that the other ETs have been coming and going and having their own bases like the Nordics under the sea, that's exactly what the Defense Intelligence Agency analyst in December of 1999 that I have talked to you about, he was retiring, he wanted to talk with me, he sought me out through a bank, World Bank person, and we had this profound seven-hour discussion. That was one of the best things that ever happened to me in this difficult field, and that included his telling me that the Nordics, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed, that what they liked to do was to go down below the basins of the oceans and the seas of Earth, and that they had very large uh, bases in huge caverns, not at the bottom in the water. You go through the bottom of all the oceans, all of the bays, all of the seas, and you would come into bases that were built and operated by the Nordics and that the different non-humans have different places on Earth where they have bases. It makes so much sense. It's just that that's technology that we humans don't have and would not understand uh, how to do unless we start collaborating with non-humans, which we remember Louis Elizondo talked about USOs and it's clear that our government, even if they don't say it, our government has known for a very long time that there are non-humans who have bases inside of mountains, deep under the ocean floors, uh, all over this planet. And, and that is another evolutionary point where we're going to have to learn how to have that information and live on a planet where there are other advanced intelligences that come and go. Go ahead, Ian. 
Linda, let's tell everyone about your appearance at Contact in the Desert. I'm going to post the links again in the chat and also at the bottom of the notes for tonight. So Contact in the Desert is from May the 30th until June the 3rd. And I'm putting up the links here now on the, uh, on the live chat. Uh, I want to also go to the Super Chats and thank all of our generous audience tonight for their contributions to Cindy Vol who I believe is going to be in contact as well. We're looking forward to seeing you there, Cindy. Terry, Whisper of Love, Yin Yang Glow, who is also praying for peace in the world. Northern Lights, Sexy Sadie, Camp Freedom, and Joni B. Thank you very much. Yes, and for all of you who I'm sure read the same articles I do about the increasing, uh, we'll say the frequency of the universe, the frequencies, that there are more and more physicists and others who talk about the consciousness frequency relationship between different parts of the universe and what we see through the James Webb Telescope, for example, and that it's building up to, it seems to me, that we are in a space physics that humans have never really been taught exactly how it all is and evolved. And that the more we learn, the more we are beginning to see that there are so many mysteries, especially as you get back further and further, it's really fascinating. And that's, isn't that part of what we humans should have a right on earth to learn from other advanced intelligences who already have the answer to dark energy, the what was the creation point? Are there no ends? Is it all infinity? As Roger Penrose said, infinite cycles of time, no singularities. What is the truth? And ultimately, when we knew that information, how would that change our relationship to evolving with each other on earth and working with advanced beings who understand it so much better. Wouldn't that be exciting if it were all positive, that we actually were with intelligences that wanted to teach us, meaning the whole population, not just trillionaires and uh, aerospace companies. Go ahead. Yeah, we've got a, a question from Don K. Johnson, who's a long-time viewer and uh, contributor in our chat. Question for Linda, what do owls have to do with missing time or abductions? I don't get it. Please explain. And I will say as well, um, mention that Mike Clement had written a whole book, or two books actually, on the messengers, owls, synchronicity, and the UFO abductee, etc. I so, had deep, think, yeah, I had many conversations about the owl uh, with Dr. Sprinkle and Bud Hopkins and uh, Dr. Mack, and uh, th this would be one of those subjects. I know I've talked about it with Whitley Strieber. The owl, and I'm going to put it into this box, not like I'm saying this is absolute, uh, this is the answer, bottom line answer, but this is part of the dialogue. The, if you're dealing with the greys, when they would come into a room or be at a window or whatever, if you were dealing with the greys, they have the big black eyes and the head that comes big and the thin body that their appearance to humans can be, let's say, out on a terrace or maybe they are levitating. And it became associated with the idea that they look like an owl or that the beings were projecting a technology over themselves that was a technology of sh shape shifting that they can either put a physical coating, a subatomic coating in those uh, leotard-like suits that most of them wear, and that if they know what they're doing, they will change 
the subatomic surface of how they appear to someone. I've had that described to me. Uh, then there is the manipulation of the human that most of the beings can put in our minds because they work in telepathy, an image so that they would be cloaking themselves to the person in whatever way and that the owl throughout decades, the owl has been one of the most common in which people have said, it, at first it looked like an owl or I thought it was an owl that landed on the wall or th that kind of approach and then it'll get more complex and then the, the human will begin to second guess themselves. Is that really an owl? And there lies this complex landscape that people in the abduction syndrome have always been with that what they were shown as interacting with them may not be the actual being that is doing the projection or the shape shifting. And that's been another level of complexity. Why that is done is not exactly clear, but I would say that it's fair over hundreds and hundreds of years that at least the material that has been written or even that we find maybe carved in a stone wall of what looked like uh, something with large eyes and it's uh, over six or seven hundred years old and uh, people going in and looking for ancient places and sites and find even things that look like craft that was the being, does it look like what is carved or was that what was being put into the mind of the human? And that is what makes this field more difficult and harder to understand is because the non-humans can disguise themselves or present themselves to us in the form of an owl or a bird or whatever. And one of the I would say evolutionary steps eventually, I hope, will be that we will finally be on a planet where there will be universities <laughs> that take as far back as we can go up to the present of all of the evolutionary influences on humans by non-humans for so long. And where we are today and how we get past this point of confusion, conflict, war, that, that's where the rubber hits the road right now. Go ahead, Ian. I want to remind people that this edition of Earth Files and all editions of Earth Files is also available as a podcast wherever you get your podcasts yeah. from. And remind people to like us and subscribe it all helps. And that they turn around every Thursday, right? We do live Wednesdays and then the podcasts turn around on Thursdays, right? Yeah, I believe so. The, the new podcast yeah. goes out uh, yeah. straight away afterwards. So I think on the Thursday, as Earth Files uh, yeah. rolls out across the, the Earth. DJ Fulcrum is in the chat tonight and says, uh, seems to have a similar experience to Lorraine's, um, which the says, subtle con contacting you in dreams. I had dreamt twice and I've never before that the saucer and the being were standing and looking far beyond my being. So a lot of people, again, putting this down to vivid dreams, but these vivid dreams are probably relating to real experiences. I think then the question is, does anybody know how, what percentage of human descriptions of being waked up suddenly seeing a shadow or seeing a beam of light or seeing orbs of light. Orbs of light that are about the size of a ping pong ball are very common at the beginning of some abduction cases. Why the differences? But that is, to me, why I love doing the work I do because I feel with every month and every year that we keep going, that more and more 
is coming out that would be in the category of learning, <laughs> learning more about ourselves as well as this universe. So <coughs> I'm being overcome. I think it's Juniper. Brad and I both, our eyes are red. We've been taking allergy pills, but there's a big juniper tree here. So sorry. Go ahead. I'll go a, a couple more because we started a tiny bit late. Yeah, we've also got um, Hunter7E7 has posted in the chat, but floating down my hall at night, and when I try to turn on lights, they do not work. Uh, that's another experience that many people have about floating down the hallway. I myself had experiences when I was a child of uh, feeling that I was floating down down the stairs. Many, many times that happened to me. To you, uh, to, to you Ian. Uh, yes, it did. Um, I just felt like I was floating it. And actually, I want to just reference an experience that Lorraine puts in her book. She remembers going through the wall because actually she de details seeing the cobwebs within the bricks as she went through the wall. That's as, right. Uh, as a child. That was an extraordinary detail. And, and what is the recorder? What is it in the brain, in the memory, that is recording that detail that she would be able years later to describe. That to me is another fascinating part. Clearly, humans have the ability to interact with this phenomena if we were given the chance perhaps to learn. And by that I mean if we're not in the position of being afraid of the unknown and we are introduced and we know that we are dealing with allies that would be an important step, allies who really cared about us and our survival, which is what I think that the Nordics, or at least some of them do. They have a vested interest. That, that makes it, I'm just going to say, more exciting to contemplate that hopefully that in two or three years that the controlled remote viewing that by 2030, that the Earth will have gone through some huge, gigantic, massive depopulation. Maybe it's not settled. Maybe we are at a time in 2024 where the frequencies between the universe and our minds are developing something that could turn around and be really positive. And that if we understood that if humans could concentrate on things that were positive and evolutionary and not threatening in war, it might make a difference to every year coming up in the future. And then that would mean that we were being educated about how to strengthen ourselves and our souls in a universe that does seem to have a tremendous challenge about how to interact with it without going extinct. And maybe going forward, for those of you who are right now tonight, you think that like Lorraine and so many others, you are, you are having face to face and there's no mystery, or you may not be face to face, it may be a more indirect and you're not sure what it is you're interacting with. Uh, write, email, contact us, go to the messages, and let us know what you are experiencing and what you would like to understand. And I will, in a future program or programs, I will take what comes and we'll evolve our own education with each other about what is happening to people who are coming to Earth Files YouTube to try to understand and hear from people who might be having similar experiences so that we can turn the unknown into the known, that we can turn that which seems scary into something that is actually fascinating. Meanwhile, always knowing that without being told the truth and not having the facts, we really don't know all that is at stake. 
And on that note tonight, I want to say thank you to Ian, to Eric, to Brad, to Chocolate, to Fluffy, for keeping the Earth Files YouTube channel going. We love doing this, and we just keep hoping that we're going to get the whole huge open headline, we're not alone. And that in that headline, in that first real public global breakthrough, there will be a handshake, metaphorically or physically, between us humans and other intelligences that are so vast in their ability to interact with this universe that they can move point to point, light years in seconds. On that note, a kind of exciting note, let's hope going forward that next week, no more war, no more conflict. And I know people will smile at that. But that's my wish. I love you guys. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select a language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions them. will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been <laughs>